Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Patrick Reynolds, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, it's an honor to get up here and speak in front of you all tonight. It's an honor to be asked. Uh, thanks, Steve, for uh, reaching out to Jerry and, and getting me out here. And um, thank you all of you to, for being here. Drake, Norman, I really appreciate you coming out. Uh, my sobriety date is October 14th of 2017. My home group is the Fourth Dimension Group in Clayton. Uh, we're a three legacy group. We, we take a lot of pride in, in being in the solution of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, we just celebrated our one year anniversary, which is awesome. I think we had over 100 people show up for that anniversary. Uh, about 90% of our home group is in their first year of sobriety, which is absolutely amazing, but horrifying at the same time. Um, it's been an absolute journey getting to grow with these individuals in this group, and I'll get to touch a little bit on that tonight. But um, without a doubt, it's been the most meaningful and most purposeful part of my sobriety uh, since I've gotten sober is just being a part of that group. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't enjoy speaking. I, I get to do it often. Um, and, you know, I, I was taught to not make speeches really just in a general way, kind of share with you what it was like growing up when I started drinking, what my al active alcoholism was like, uh, what brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and, and really what I've done in Alcoholics Anonymous to give me relief from um, my drinking and more, more so give me the ability to live life. You know, it gives me these principles in which to live by, and, and I really want to touch a lot on that today. Um, but to kind of get started, to qualify myself, I was born and raised in Clayton, North Carolina. Um, had a very normal childhood growing up, two wonderful parents, you know, I was very active in sports, happy kid for most of my life. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I got to be about 13, 14 years old, and, and, and I noticed, you know, my mentality started to change. You know, I just felt different in a lot of ways socially. Um, and, you know, I ended up discovering alcohol. So, you know, at about 10 or 11 years old, I, I had stolen some beers out of my dad's fridge, and it really didn't do much for me. Um, you know, it tasted, it tasted horrible. I didn't, I didn't get the effect of alcohol until I was about 14 years old. I was tall enough to finally see into my, my father's liquor cabinet. And uh, it was Jim Beam, and I remember, you know, I had no concept of how alcohol worked. You know, I, I just I poured a whole glass of Jim Beam, like a whole pint full, and just figured, you know, that's what my parents did. They drank that whole, that whole thing. Um, and I remember going back to my room, and it was a magical moment, you know, the, all the curiosity wrapped around alcohol and, like, seeing my parents drink and seeing other people's, people drink, I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, so I went back to my room, was by myself. I remember that 70s show was playing. It's, like, 1130 at night, and, and I chugged that whole glass of Jim Beam. And, um, you know, the, the effect that it had, I'll never forget. You know, it, as soon as it hit my lips and my tongue and my teeth, I, I felt it through my whole body. You know, my hands tingled my, all the way down to my feet. My teeth went numb. My face went numb. And I just I felt that warm and fuzzy feeling. You know, the effect that alcohol produced, it hit me, and it hit me hard. And um, I ended up getting really sick, waking up the next day. And, you know, like most of us in here, like I, I couldn't wait to do it again. I was absolutely miserable. Um, you know, unfortunately, I, you know, I, I ended up getting caught by my parents like very shortly doing it again, and, and they kind of locked it away in the house. So it was really hard for me to get. Um, but eventually, you know, I, I got it when I was 16. I was out and about. Normal run-of-the-mill stuff for someone that's drinking in high school. Um, you know, I always drank differently than everyone. Uh, but for the most part, I stayed out of trouble. I had a, a few run-ins with the law when I was young, but, but nothing serious. Um, and then at 17 years old, I decided to, to go into the United States Marine Corps. So this is 2009. Uh, 2009 to 2013, I served, and, and, and that's really where my drinking started to take off. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on my service or anything like that other than to, you know, just really explain that, you know, I mean, if anyone's in the military, they know that, you know, to drink like that is pretty acceptable. Um, so there wasn't really red flags until later into my enlistment. Um, and I eventually went to my first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting at about 19 years old. Um, you know, life was really brutal there for a few years. Um, my drinking went to, to really bad places, but I found myself, like I said, very young in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, and, um, you know, that was kind of the, the start of my journey, in a say, knowing that I had a, a serious problem with alcoholism. But I wasn't ready to get sober. I was kind of forced into it. Um, and to backtrack, when I was 16 and I got in a little trouble in high school, I remember my dad sitting me you know, on the front porch, and, and he said, son, like, alcoholism runs deep in your family. Um, just be very mindful of it, you know. And I can remember at about 19, 20 years old, um, starting to, you know, kind of lose control of my drinking, and, and, and I could just, that was replaying in my head, like, oh, man, like, maybe I am an alcoholic. Um, 
But, you know, sure enough, I wasn't ready to get sober. And, you know, I got out of the Marine Corps at 21 and, and got into civilian life. And, um, you know, my, my drinking got worse. And this is kind of the, the point of the story. It continues to get worse. But at about 21, 22 years old, I mean, that's when, you know, I didn't have a job anymore. I was out. I was on my own. I was by myself. And, um, you know, I had a little bit of money saved up. And, and drinking got bad quick. You know, it, it really did. I found myself waking up in the mornings and starting to drink. Um, drinking the clock around, not being able to hold a job, not being able to go to school. Um, and, you know, it, it just got worse and worse. And I, 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 found, a, I found a woman, I, got her, I held her hostage, I got into a relationship and, uh, you know, we ended up moving to South Carolina for a period of time. It was about 22, 23. Um, you know, by this point, I had already totaled a few cars because of my alcoholism. My health was really starting to decline. And, um, really, the first moment came to where I knew I was I was really screwed. Like this thing had me licked, and uh, and I woke up I woke up in my uh, second bedroom on the floor one night, just you know sicker than hell and going through extreme DTs. I, I was very very sick at this point, and you know it was the first moment I looked to the girl I was dating. And was like I need help, like you know like please get me help. Um, so this is my my first trip into a, a detox facility in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and I can just remember going into this place just absolutely just dumbfounded, being 23 years old, you know, not understanding how I had gotten here, how it had progressed this fast, just absolutely hopeless. I mean, it just seemed like a blur, you know. Um, and I was in this detox facility, and, and I had no idea how this thing worked. And, and I remember going in there, they stripped you down, they took your shoe strings, and, you know, there was two nurses there, maybe in their mid-20s, you know, beautiful nurses, and, and I'm, I'm stripping down naked. And, you know, I'm covered in bruises, my face is swollen, my stomach's distended. Um, I just look like absolute hell. And I can remember sitting there just like absolutely dumbfounded, not knowing how I had gotten to this point. And I can remember the, for the first time I was in there and I was like, I'm, I'm done drinking. Like, I'm never going to do this again. Um, you know, I was destroying my family. I was destroying a relationship. I couldn't hold a job. My health was declining drastically at 23 years old. So for sure, you know, I was convinced at that point that I was going to quit drinking. Um, and I was, you know, I could have passed a lie detector test, as many people say. Um, so I got out of that detox like maybe a week, week and a half later, and uh, found my way back into Alcoholics Anonymous out in Charleston. And um, I can remember going to that meeting, you know, it was really my second meeting, but I, I kind of consider that my first real meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it was a very large group. And... You know, my first impression of everyone in Alcoholics Anonymous was, was pretty bad, you know, and, and not to say that that group wasn't good, uh, but I was so sick when I got there, you know, I, I wanted to find every little thing wrong with Alcoholics Anonymous. I wanted to dissect it from every, you know, every level. I wanted to find reasons why I didn't want to go. You know, deep down inside, I was horrified to continue drinking, but, you know, I just didn't think that Alcoholics Anonymous was the answer. Um, and I stuck around for maybe a month. And then that kind of started the cycle where I was in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous for many years. You know, and part of the reason, you know, I told myself was, you know, you're only 23 years old. You know, like, you don't need to get sober yet. Or whatever the crazy stuff that we tell ourselves in our head, I, I was telling myself. And, um, you know, I, I would go in, I would get a, a home group, I would get a sponsor, I would start working the steps, and I would get drunk. And, you know, looking back on it now, I mean, there's a million reasons why I kept getting drunk. Um, but I never fully got into Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I, I, I would go to my sponsor, I'd work the steps, and I would tell him what I thought he wanted to hear. I was going to this gentleman trying to impress him, but there was a lot of dark stuff going on in my head and in my heart that uh, I wasn't getting honest about. And um, you know, I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I didn't want to be honest. Or I didn't want to be honest with anyone. You know, not not even myself. And. Um, that was a really, really dark time in my drinking. You know, being in and out and in and out, it, it gets a little bit more hopeless every single time. Um, and eventually I was just out, you know. Like I, I got about nine months of sobriety one stretch and, um, you know, I, I went through the steps pretty quickly with the sponsor, but I wasn't willing to, to really do anything else after that. You know, I got through the steps and, and I wasn't willing to sponsor anyone. Um, I would probably go to one meeting a week. I didn't want to do anything at my home group. I'd show up right as the meeting started, and I would leave as soon as it ended. And um, you know, I started I started using some outside issues. I started smoking weed, and you know, that's a big problem for a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And and um, and I have I have some experience to share on it. Like I was doing that, and uh, 
you know, about three or four months go by and, and some really heavy stuff came on my plate and, and, and that, that, that thing was not strong enough for me anymore. So I went back to alcohol and, uh, you know, short, short story, things got really hectic. They got really crazy out here in, in Charleston at the time. And, uh, my relationship that I was in blew up, you know, all this embarrassment. So essentially what I did is this relationship blew up. My alcoholism brought me to this really sick place where when I, when I figured that I was losing her and I was losing everything around me, I came up with this, uh, this lie that I had cancer. Um, you know, and, and this is the, the depths that alcoholism will bring me to. I mean, just absolutely insanity. So I make up this lie in a blackout and, uh, you know, I wake up the next day and my mom's calling me thinking I have cancer. And it was just one of those moments where, you know, all this darkness is just coming down on me and I have no idea what to do. So essentially I buy a plane ticket and a guy that I served with had been out in Colorado, and he's one of us. And I said, screw it. I'm just going to run away from everything. So sure enough, I bought that plane ticket, went out to Colorado, um, was homeless out there for about a, uh, about a month, month and a half with this guy. And to be honest with you, it was a lot of fun. You know, like I, I had relapsed out of this relationship. I was in Colorado. I was doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, I was drinking every day. I had no responsibilities. And, you know, eventually the money ran out and it was time to go back to work. And um, what ended up happening is I came back to Clayton, I gathered all my stuff up and, uh, you know, I hit the road for Colorado. I was going to make a move out there and get settled. And, um, and to be truthful, I was just running away from all the damage that I had, I had caused here. And I was so embarrassed and so shameful and so full of guilt and mainly fear i had all this fear about what was actually going to happen to me like i knew i was not heading in the right in the right direction um so on this on this trip out to colorado and i love telling this story because i'm still amazed that i didn't get locked up or something serious didn't happen on this trip but it was a five-day trip and um like a good alcoholic i packed my car up with the bare minimum tons of liquor tons of other things and and i make my way out to colorado and and on this trip um about the first night I get into, a little, like right into Kansas and, and I'm absolutely hammered. I, I got a, a cup full of liquor in the car um, and I get pulled over. So this is, this is the first interaction with a police officer on this trip. Um, I tell him, hey man, I got firearms in the car. Like, you know, you need to run, you need to run the numbers. Like just trying to be honest with you. And, and this gentleman pulls me in his cop car. I'm absolutely hammered in the middle of the country in Kansas. And uh, this cop just runs my, my serial numbers for my firearms and lets me go. And I'm lost, man. Like, I'm in the middle of farmland in Kansas, like, half blacked out. My gas is running out, and I'm lost. Somehow I find a gas station. He lets me go, um, you know, and, and I think I'm good. That same night, I get into Topeka, Kansas, and I'm actually going to get more alcohol. And uh, I end up rear-ending a family of four. My dog runs away. I chase after my dog. The cops end up finding me, arresting me. I, I somehow plead my story to them about what's happening. These cops, again, drive me to my hotel, let me go. Find my dog two days later, get a rental car, and I keep trucking. Um, very next day, I get the rental car, and I'm going into Colorado. And this is the third interaction with cops. I get pulled over, and this time I wasn't drunk, but I had some outside issues in the car with me. Um, and, and they kind of noticed that I was nervous when I got pulled over this time. And long story short, they, they end up finding the, you know, they find the outside issues in my car. Um, and end, end up letting me go again. So in about five days, it's three interactions where I should have gotten locked up and I didn't. And I only really tell that story because it's an absolute miracle. And, uh, but it's a very small part of my story, but this is really where it kick-started this two-year stretch that I was on a relapse after being in and out for about three or four years. Um, and, and those two years, it was in Denver, Colorado, were probably the darkest years of my life. I started doing things that I never thought I would do, hanging out with people I never thought I would hang out with. My alcohol... My alcoholism and it brought me to uh, just one of the darkest places in my life like I, I could sit here and, and give you examples of what was going on all day but there was just nothing there you know I had no hope for tomorrow um, I don't know how I made it two years drinking the way I was drinking and doing the things I was doing and sometimes I think back you know and I just don't understand how alcoholics can keep going um, and I ended up getting a you know finally ended up getting in trouble thank God so this is around August of 2017. Um, I get my first DUI. I get arrested. 
about three weeks later, I go to court, I get my sentencing, and the day I get sentenced and, and fingerprints get taken, I go out and get a second DUI that same night. And I hit a median going about 70, 75 miles per hour and end up getting locked up for this one. Um, and, you know, at this point, I remember waking up in county, county jail that night and I was covered in my own blood and I had no idea how I got there. And I drove drunk all the time. I mean, you know, I, it was just no matter what, like I'm getting behind the car, even if it's just to go have fun. Like I, I just I naturally want to drive when I get drunk. Or I'm going to drive, if I don't have a car, I'm going to drive your car kind of thing. Like, I just like to drive. I don't, I don't know why. But um, I definitely thought I had, you know, committed vehicular manslaughter waking up in county jail. And, and, you know, and it didn't scare me at that point. Like, I had become so numb to what alcoholism had done to me and, and what I was doing in active alcoholism with all the mistakes I had made. Like, I just kind of had accepted that this was my fate at this point. Like, it was either I was going to end up in prison or, or dead. Um, but I ended up getting out of jail that, that next day, and I drank for about another month. And uh, I can remember running out of, and I want to get into the solution, so I'm almost done with my story but with my drinking. But um, I drank for a couple more weeks maybe. And I remember this night as clear as day. It was one of those nights where you, you have no money. You know, you just got to your second DUI while you're on probation for your first one. Uh, I had ruined every relationship that I had. I had lost my job, and I had ran out of booze. And the only thing left was my firearm, you know. And it was one of these moments I woke up, and I was about half sober, and I was just horrified. I didn't see any way out, you know, no way out. And I knew Alcoholics Anonymous. Like, I knew it worked for individuals, or I knew it worked for people. Um, but in that moment, I just, uh, I thought there was no way out. So, uh, like, I, I was decided, I decided that day I was going to kill myself and ended up not doing it. Um, thank God, like, I had a thought, you know, you know, and maybe this was God working in my life at the time. But my mom always used to tell me, like, son, it, it, you know, and I had been struggling with year, for years with suicide and, and my alcoholism. And um, she always said, you know, it'll always get better. And, and I'm glad I listened to that because I didn't, I didn't pull the trigger. And, and luckily, instead, I, I called her. And just got clean about everything that had happened and, and, and said, hey, I want to try to get sober again. So one more trip to the detox. Um, and I spent about a week in there, and then I was back in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think in between all that time, I'd been to the detox facilities maybe five or six times. You know, I was, I was a pretty, pretty much a regular there. Um, but at this point in my life, you know, like I'm 20, 26, um, I just, to be honest with you, when I got sober and this time and I went to Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I didn't have very much hope, you know, because I had been in and out of the rooms for so many years. I, I had started to believe that, you know, I believed that Alcoholics Anonymous worked, but I didn't believe it would work for me. I, I just, I just had no hope. I, you know, I thought I was too weak. Um, but to be honest with you, I just didn't want to quit drinking. I wanted to quit going to jail. I wanted to quit losing my loved ones. I wanted to quit losing relationships. I wanted to quit being sick. Um, I wanted to live a normal life, but I didn't want to quit drinking. I didn't want to change the way I was acting. And, and uh, you know, it was, it was a struggle. But I walked up to a group called Vitality in uh, Westminster, Colorado. And, uh, you know, this man named Larry Topper, he was my sponsor out there for the first three and a half years. And, and uh, this man saved my life. And, and one of the most important things I think we can do in a home group for someone that comes in new or someone that comes in and has 10 or 15 years of sobriety is to make them feel welcome. And, and that's exactly what he did. As soon as I walked through the door, he came up and shook my hand. He welcomed me. He gave me a cup of coffee, and, and he just got to know me. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I owe a, a sense of debt to this man because he had a unique way of doing it to where I didn't feel like you know, I believed this man. I believed his story. You know, like I, I believed everything about him, the actions he took in that home group. Um, and, you know, he asked me one, one simple question when I first got there that I, I didn't really know how to answer. And uh, he just asked me, why do you keep getting drunk? Like, what makes you an alcoholic? And, and, uh, and I told him, I don't know. Like, I don't know why I keep getting drunk. And I was like, I think I'm an alcoholic because I keep getting DUIs. I keep going to jail. I keep losing my relationships. And and uh, he kind of laughed and he said, no, that's, that's not really what makes you an alcoholic. And, and, what, and this is just my experience, but what he really, you know, drilled into me was the mental obsession. You know, like a big part of the first step, we talk about we're powerless over alcohol, but, you know, he asked me, he was like, well, actually, what makes you powerless over alcohol? And I really couldn't understand that, you know. 
And uh, you know, you read the doctor's opinion in the big book, and it talks about the physical part of this disease. And and I understood that, you know, I understood that. I, I knew that once I started drinking, I, I could not stop. And, and the very next morning, like I'm craving more alcohol. You know, physically, I, you know, I'm going through delirium tremens. Like my body needs it. But I could not understand that that strange mental phenomenon that happens with alcoholics. And you know, like I, I could look. I could look backwards and see all these horrible things that alcoholism and my drinking was causing me. And I could wake up in the mornings and be like, I'm absolutely not going to drink today. And then by two or three that afternoon, I'm drinking. Um, and the same, it would be the same case after months of sobriety. And you know, he just hammered, he hammered home early on about this mental obsession and, and really about the mental blank spot. Um, because what, what happened to me for all those years is and this is what made me so dumbfounded. I'd be sitting in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and everything would be fine. You know, like my life was getting better, uh, my work was getting better, my relationships were getting better. And I'd be sitting in a meeting like this, and halfway through the meeting, I, I would decide to go get drunk. And then I would go get drunk. And, and I had no understanding of why. Like, you know, and uh, I was just absolutely clueless to what we do here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and he helped me understand the mental obsession and, uh, you know, he got me to work. He got me in the steps. Um, you know, we, we, we read the first 164 pages out of the big book, and he shared his experience with me as we went through that big book. And when there was a step in that big book, we took that step. And when there was a prayer, we said that prayer. And more importantly, like, the steps are vitally important. But more importantly, he got me involved in Alcoholics Anonymous very early on. Um, you know, we would, we would take meetings into the detox centers, and he got me doing that from, like, the first month I was sober. Um, and then we would all get together on Friday nights and we would travel around, you know, Colorado, hour, hour and a half away. We'd all pile in a car and go to a meeting together. And, uh, you know, that was a huge part of what kept me sober early on. Because, you know, when I went through the steps this last time around, you know, I, I was still in such a fog, you know, and I was still lacking so much humility because I couldn't get honest with this man about how I was truly doing. I didn't think I had the capability of doing that. Um, I was so numb and just, in, in so, I was in survival mode, you know, and I, I was just in so much fear, but he just kept, you know, he kept moving me in that right direction, and I did my first fist step, and I wasn't honest, you know, and, and I was lying all the time still. I was really sick the first couple of years of my sobriety, um, but, you know, he, like I said, he got me extremely involved, and he got me involved quick, and the biggest part for me early on was the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, you know, it was... It was really tough early on because, you know, I, I was absolutely alone when I got to AA. I mean, I had ran away from my entire family. You know, I had no one left. And uh, Alcoholics Anonymous took me in. You know, they took me in when I had no driver's license. I was going to jail in a few months. I had no job, and I was an absolute asshole. Like, I was just, I was so full of myself, and I thought I knew everything at 26 years old. And uh, they loved me unconditionally. So... About six months later, I come in, I go through the steps. About six or seven months later, I end up beating that court case, um, that second DUI. So I, I get out of jail. And, and why I talk about that mental obsession is as soon as I found out I was no longer on probation and I wasn't going to jail, that obsession came back. And it came back strong. And I didn't tell anyone about it. So about month seven or eight, you know, I'm getting really squirrely. And, um, I'm, I'm headed out at this point. Like I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much decided I'm going to get drunk. And um, what ended up happening is, you know, my sponsor, he, he knew it. He could see it, you know, from a mile away. And uh, there was an opportunity to start a meeting at our home group. Um, and, and it was an, actually an As Bill Sees It meeting on Wednesday. And my sponsor advised us to go start this meeting. And... Uh, you know, we talk about making commitments early on in sobriety, and, and I think this is kind of what saved my life at that time and, and, and kept me sober was I was so resentful at the people in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was judging every single person in here. Um, and, you know, I think that's a big reason why he told me to start this meeting. You know, I had all these issues with the, how the meeting was ran, and I got seven months of sobriety. I, I don't know anything at this point. Um, so we start this meeting, and, and I wasn't going to any other meetings at the time. Like, this is it. And, you know, like clockwork, every Wednesday morning I'd wake up and I'd be so incredibly angry that I had to go to this meeting and I had to chair this meeting. Um, but it kept me sober. You know, it absolutely kept me sober for about six months to a year. And, um, 
you know, I, I don't like telling that story too much because, like, I didn't do this thing the way it's meant to be early on. And I suffered great amounts of agony because of that. You know, I probably obsessed over alcohol for the first two years of my sobriety. Um, and, you know, I, I use that as an asset today when I sponsor other men because, you know, I really try to sponsor and encourage them to not do what I did. You know, like really try to keep an open mind when you come to Alcoholics Anonymous and not try to sit there and judge everything that we do. Um, because what ended up happening is that about two, about two years, um, you know, I got to this point in sobriety, and I think a lot of us do, where we, we come to this place of needing to surrender all over again. Like darkness just came into my life, and I had no means or way of dealing with it. Um, so what ended up happening is there's some pretty heavy stuff in my fist step that uh, I never shared with anybody. There's some really horrible stuff that happened to me when I was a child. And there's some pretty bad things that I've done in my life. And, and I kind of kept this all bottled in. And I was so ashamed to go talk to another man about this. And, you know, it just got to a point where I was absolutely broken. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of times, you know, I just wanted to stay sober just a little bit more than I wanted to go out and drink. And, and because of that, I finally went to my, my sponsors. Like, hey, man, I got to talk to you. Like, there's some stuff that I've never talked to anyone about that is somehow coming back into my life. And it's creeping back in. And, and it's causing me a lot of pain. And I can remember sitting in this man's house, and I finally get clean about this, this thing that I never thought I would tell anyone, that I thought I was going to take to the grave. And he starts to tear up a little bit, and um, he's like, yeah, that happened to me. And he's like, you know, now that you, you know, because you told me this, I love you just a little bit more. And I just break down, you know, just absolutely break down at, at two years of sobriety. And, and then these cool and unique things started to happen. You know, I started to get more involved in Alcoholics Anonymous because I felt more part of and one of the one of the biggest biggest or one of the best memories I have in Alcoholics Anonymous is um, there's a guy named Don Pritz. I'm sure some of you know him. Uh, he eventually he got sober out in Colorado, Denver, Colorado, and then made his way out here. I think in the 90s. He's a big part of what Alcoholics Anonymous is here locally. Uh, but Don Pritz sponsored my grand sponsor, whose name is Dick Daly, out in Colorado. And Dick Daly was at the end of his life. He had been sober about 40 years. And um, I got invited to go into one of his very last meeting. We brought him into his home. And I can remember sitting around, um, and I know nothing about Alcoholics Anonymous at two years, like absolutely nothing. And, and, and I feel like I don't have much to offer. And I go and sit in, in this room with probably 200 years of sobriety, and this guy's dying. And, uh, you know, they, you know they, they made me share. They made me share my experience on whatever we were talking about. And... They got so much out of my share, at least that's what they told me. Maybe they were just making me feel good. Um, but it, it, was, it was absolutely insane to be there for this gentleman's last meeting. We didn't know it at the time. Uh, the very next day he passed away. But that's a very fond memory that I always look back on to know that I was a part of that and, and was able to take a meeting into someone's home. Um, and that's what really kick-started my journey to get, get back involved in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, full-time. Like get a service commitment in my group, be involved in my home group. Um, I wanted to start sponsoring other men. I had that fire underneath me again, and then COVID happened. So this is 2020, and, uh, you know, I don't want to get too much into that, but essentially COVID caused my wife, and I met my wife in Alcoholics Anonymous, too, at this time. We had just gotten married, and um, we decided to move back to Clayton to be with family. And uh, so we're, we're uprooted. We leave our home group. We leave our sponsors. You know, we leave everything that we're comfortable with, and we move out here to North Carolina. And... Uh, you know, this is 2021, right at the end of the pandemic. Meetings are still starting to open up here. And um, we get out here and, you know, just we get sick and we get sick quick. You know, as alcoholics, like if I step away from being in service of Alcoholics Anonymous, being a part of a home group, being connected, having a network of men that I can talk to on a regular basis, I get sick and I get sick quick. And, you know, that obsession to, to escape came back. You know, it wasn't. The obsession to drink probably left about two, two years in for me, um, but other obsessions started to come, and I started to struggle with other things. And when I got out here, I got into that dark place that, that I was familiar with yet again and um, went to a Cleveland 12-step group out in Cleveland. That's where I met Aaron Dubois, and, and Aaron could see it from a, a mile away that I, you know we weren't okay. And, and I'm grateful again that one thing that saved my life when I first came in, Aaron did it for me again, and he made me feel welcome in that group. And, and by him doing that, by him, you know, reaching his hand out, getting my number and reaching out to me, I eventually asked that man to sponsor me again. 
and, uh, and and here's another journey, you know, through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I get to start working the steps with this man, and and my life starts to get a little bit better, and uh, so my wife and I are sitting at home, maybe about a year and two or three months ago, and we're really upset that there's not a lot of meetings out in Clayton, you know, like Tuesday, Thursdays, and Fridays, there's no meetings, so we jokingly, you know, started talking about starting a meeting. And, and sure enough, we did. We, uh, we called a church, and we were like, hey, we want to start an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting on Tuesday and Thursdays. And they are like, sure, let's do it. And the next week, you know, we were in that church having our first meeting. And, and that's really where I want to focus my talk tonight is um, what I've been able to learn and grow through in Alcoholics Anonymous since starting that meeting. You know, at, at three years of sobriety, I thought I knew shit. I thought I knew what Alcoholics Anonymous was. I thought I knew how living by these, or I thought I knew how to live by these principles that we always talk about. Um, I thought I knew service in Alcoholics Anonymous. I thought I knew what unity service and recovery was. Um, and man, I had no clue. Like, uh, and I still don't have all the answers and I don't know much. Um, but what happened, you know, by starting that meeting is, you know, first and foremost, it, being, being in service to Alcoholics Anonymous and having the opportunity to do that is one of the most humbling things that I've ever been able to do. It's one of the hardest things that I've ever been able to do too. Um, but what I will tell you is, is, is seeing that group grow from its infancy stage of day one and to be where it is today, it's absolutely unreal. And, and I really want to kind of hone in on why that group is the way it is and why individuals there, there's multiple individuals in our home group that are coming up to a year of sobriety. And, and in my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous, a lot of the people that walk through this door and try to get sober don't make it. Um, and, 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 and there's a lot of truth to that. But in this group, we keep getting surprised, you know, uh, we keep seeing people pick up chips, and it's just like, man, and in my head, I thought they were going to drink six months ago. Um, but, you know, what was really lacking in my program was, one, sponsorship. You know, the 12th step, carrying this message to other men, and, and primarily in sponsorship. And two, it was service and unity. I mean, it was these three, these three legacies that we live by, and I, I never truly was fully in that. Um, and, and we took a lot of pride early on with that group being very, very involved at the service level. Um, you know, it, it's been absolutely unreal to get in there. And, and the next thing I know, like, there's only three of us that have any substantial sobriety at this group to start it off. And the next thing you know, Clayton's booming. It's getting, it's getting ginormous. And just new person after new person after new person comes into this group. I mean, to the point where I think one meeting early on, we looked around, and there was like 25 people in there, and there was only two of us with over a year of sobriety. And, and, and I was able to start sponsoring a lot of men. And that is really where I learned Alcoholics Anonymous and learned how to start carrying these principles in my life. And, um, you know, this all kind of started when I was going through some really horrible stuff in my life. And I was at this really dark place. And, um, you know, I just I credit Aaron and, and Jerry uh, for really taking us under their wing and, and really showing us and guiding us on how to um, run a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And... What ended up happening is, is these new people start to come in, they start to get on fire with Alcoholics Anonymous because all they ever knew was our group. And, and, and what we try to do at our group is to be a very solution-based. Um, and as soon as people get in and they qualify for service commitments, we're putting them in service commitments. Um, and, and we take a lot of pride in the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and not because the traditions are rules, because they're not rules, you know, they are suggestions, but um, you know, one of, the, one, of the, one of the best things that I got to do with Aaron is, is go through the traditions and, and really learn how to apply these principles in my personal life. And, um, you know, the steps, it, it teaches me to, to live by these principles in my personal life, and the traditions teach me how to live it, in, you know, in the group of Alcoholics Anonymous. But there's so many solid principles that are in those traditions that I get to apply into my personal life. Um, and one of the biggest things that I've had to work on in that group is humility. Because, you know, for me, that's kind of, that is the most important part of my program in many ways is humility. Because what kills me quicker than anything is my ego, you know? And, and when I talk about humility, it's not me talking, you know, walking around saying I'm the best, but I always had issues going to people, like especially my sponsor, and saying, hey man, like I'm in a really, really dark place right now. Um, and it, it took me many years. It, 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 I had to be broken by some things before I was willing to have that level of humility. Um, and, and today I get, to, I get to carry that message in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I get to sponsor a ton of men, which is probably the, the single-handedly single the most important part of my life today, is being able to take these men through the steps and get to see them recover 
and, and I know a lot of men and women in these rooms are at this place now, but your sponsees start to sponsor other people. Um, and that's, that's one of the greatest gifts is when a, a sponsee calls you and is so excited and on fire with Alcoholics Anonymous because they have this new man that they're sponsoring and, and the lights just kind of click, you know? Because I was always told, like, you, you'll, you'll understand Alcoholics Anonymous a lot better when you start taking men through the steps. Um, and, and that's been my story, you know? And, and, and I still have so much to learn, especially at the service level. Um, but and especially at the home group level, because we're, you know, we're, we're in our infancy stage. Like I said, we're coming up um, on like 14 or 15 months. And, you know, the group was in its honeymoon period. But now, you know, new faces are coming in and, uh, and there's little schisms within the group. And, you know, I've seen groups completely fold and break down because they're not living these principles that we learn in the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. They're not living them in their group, you know, and that's kind of what we learn in the traditions. It's like, you know, our singleness of purpose and our primary purpose here in Alcoholics Anonymous is to carry the message to other alcoholics, newly sober or decades sober. Um, and I've had to learn the hard way, you know. It's like our business meetings, uh, a lot of times we're focused on what kind of coffee we should serve or what kind of donuts we should have. And, and it's, it's tough, man, but, you know, being a leader in Alcoholics Anonymous is, is trying to remind everyone in here what is our primary purpose for being here. And everything I do in life, I try to look at that, that tradition of primary purpose. Like, what is my singleness of purpose? What is my primary purpose by being here? And in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, it's a few things. But it's really just to show up and be of service to the people that walk through that door. You know, how can we better serve our community through CP, CPI, and treatment centers and stuff like that? How can we better reach Alcoholics Anonymous or alcoholics in our community? Um, and, you know, new people gravitate to it. Like, they, they truly do, and that's one of the coolest things I've seen there is, you know, like, the, all these new people that are on fire with Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, they, they want to serve the, the community. They want to serve the group. They, they, they're getting out of their comfort zone. They're, you know, if you go to our meeting, you're going to have about 15 or 20 people come shake your hand, and about 30 of us are there before the meeting, and about 20 to 15 to 20 are there for, at, like, at least an hour afterwards. And we're talking about Alcoholics Anonymous. Like, you, don't, you won't come to our group and hear us talking about politics or hear us talking about other things. Like, we, we, we really take, you know, a lot of pride in that singleness of purpose. Like, why are we here? You know, I have a lot of friends in our group, but we're not necessarily there to socialize. Like, we're there to carry the message and to recover and to learn how to practice these principles in our life. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, that I, I think I'm focusing on the most today is, you know, I always came into Alcoholics Anonymous looking for answers. You know, I would read all the different literature and I was looking for these answers. You know, I'd pray and I'd look for these answers. I'd try to listen to podcasts and find the answers there. And, you know, I, I've gone through a lot of really dark stuff in my sobriety and I've had to surrender to this thing multiple times. But the most important thing that, that I've started to do, you know, is to keep things really, really simple. You know, the solution to alcoholism is very simple. You know, and, and what, I, what I was taught by going through the first nine steps of this program, I get a better understanding of, you know, my character defects. I get a better understanding of my relationships, and I start to gain a little bit of humility. And what happens with that humility is it kind of opens a door for me and my relationship with God. And, and today, you know, is, is 10, 11, 10, 11, and 12. But, and I talk to my sponsees about this all the time. I'm not big on cliches. I'm not even necessarily big once you've had some sobriety about referencing steps. You know, our conversation is about these principles that we're living in our lives. So every conversation that we have, we talk about being honest, practicing humility, trying to be less selfish. You know, like, you know, what type of husband are you today? What type of father are you today? What type of employer are, are you today? What type of member of Alcoholics Anonymous are you today? You know, so in, in that 10th step, what I gain by talking about that all the time is I'm, I'm constantly conscious of how I'm acting. And, and what the 11th step teaches me is I'm always meditating on the, princip or the, the principles that I should be living in my life, you know. Because what, what I did in that fifth step is I set these ideals for myself. Like what type of, like I said, what type of father, husband, member of AA I want to be. I have these ideals that I'm reaching for. And, you know, my 11th step is when I meditate and pray on becoming and being that man. And what's happened is by doing that, Constantly meditating, thinking, and praying on who I want to be, what type of person I want to be. And then while I'm out there being that person, I'm constantly taking inventory. Am I being honest? Am I practicing humility? Am I trying to be selfless? Am I, am I carrying the message to, to alcoholics? 
Um, and then, you know, the 12th step just encompasses it all, you know, practicing these principles, all my affairs and carrying the message. And, and that's really what I focus on today in the solution. You know, it's, it's very, very simple stuff. So when life breaks down and life absolutely breaks down um, in sobriety, like I'm not immune to misery, I'm not immune to, to tragic things, um, you know, and I'm kind of going through stuff now, like there's stuff breaking down in my personal life within my family. And it's really some of the toughest times I've ever experienced in, in my life. And it's just different, but I, I can tell you from, from years of being in this program and, and, and learning truly how to live by these, these principles that we talk about in our lives, that when darkness ensues, I don't run for an escape anymore. Like I have absolute faith that I can go back to, Al or I can go to Alcoholics Anonymous and I can get honest with a few people and I can continue to do these very simple things that, that I just described, living by these spiritual principles that we talk about, showing up for my family, you know, in, in the midst of all this chaos, being able to show up sober with a clear head and say, hey, where can I serve? You know, and, and that's, been, that's been the greatest gift I think I've gotten from Alcoholics Anonymous is the ability to live life. It's not that I don't drink anymore. That's a, an incredible gift, and I'm very grateful for it. But for me, it's the ability to live life and to face life um, that, you know, for so many years I feel, like, I feel like I didn't have the blueprint for, you know? Like life would just absolutely break me, and, and even in sobriety. But today I think I have an answer for it, you know, and it's, it's a very simple answer. And a lot of times I have to go to my sponsor for the same answer that he's told me 10 or 15 times, you know? It's, it's, that's just how my brain works. Um, but, I, you know, I want to close with, you know, just how incredibly grateful I am for Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't, I know I wouldn't be here today without it. And, you know, six years ago, I had no, nothing left, no family, no car, no job, facing jail time. And, and today, you know, I met my wife in Alcoholics Anonymous. We've been married four years. Uh, we had our first child seven months ago, who's hopefully, God willing, will never see his mom or his dad drink. Um, we're part of an awesome home group that it is just taken off. I mean, like I said, we're only a year in and there's so many new people just on fire. Um, and, you know, members of Alcoholics Anonymous, sponsees of mine and my wife are constantly going in and out of our house. Um, I'm sure our neighbors think we're drug dealers. Um, but I, my life is full today and it's busier than it's ever been. You know, like I don't have a moment for myself and honestly, that's a good thing. Because if, if I sit there and I isolate and I'm not involved in Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm not participating in life, I die spiritually, and I have no relationship with God. And, you know, I find, I find God in these rooms, you know. Like, I, I truly do. Like, it, you know, I, I, I struggle with my faith for a very long time, but I can tell you by being sober and being involved in Alcoholics Anonymous and living this way of life, God shows up in, in unique ways. Sometimes I don't like the way God shows up, but He does. And, and it's, you know, slowly but surely I'm trying to grow. Um, I don't have all the answers. I'm not perfect. Um... I'm just grateful that I have the opportunity to sit up here and share my story and, and you know, hopefully I can help a few people along the way, um, you know, more, more than just people in Alcoholics Anonymous, but everyone that's in my life, you know. So it's good to be here and be sober. Thanks, guys.